Hello. Uh, welcome to another museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, president and chief instigator of POW, Paul Orselli Workshop. And I'm here on Long Island and I'm delighted to be joined today by Ann Ackerson. I, I chose my background because we're gonna be talking about launching into the future. So I tried to choose an appropriate Zoom background. So hi, Ann. Uh, hey, thanks, thanks for taking the time today. Uh, I always like I always like to start out by having uh, people talk a little bit about their background, sort of how they ended up <laughs> where they are now, which yeah. is a, sometimes the path is an interesting path. I think it always, almost always is. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your your background, and then we'll launch into our conversation about the future. Happy to, Paul, and thanks for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, I began my career over 40 years ago, actually, uh, right out of college uh, in uh, working in history museums and small history museums and historical societies and historic sites. And um, as a, a native New York Stater, I've spent my entire career uh, here in New York State and um, have, um, I hope, a, a, a broad understanding of uh, New York State museums and the issues that uh, face the museums here, uh, which are, of course, mostly the same issues that are facing museums everywhere. Um, uh, I, after, after working in an individual institute, individual institutions, I went on to become the executive director of the Museum Association of New York and was there for um, a quite a quite a few years and uh, really focused my efforts there on advocacy work um, was fortunate I think to to be involved in legislation relating to uh, uh, deaccessioning of collections of abandoned property which was a critical issue for uh, the state's museum community as it is in many other states too and um, and then I went kind of took a little deviation and went to work for the Council of State Archivists, which is a national association serving the 56 state and territory archives in the United States. And that is a, a relationship that I continue now as a contractor and uh, helping them with uh, communication and doing some development work and that kind of thing. I've been, um, I've been active in consulting work since the late 1990s. But it uh, wasn't until just a couple of years ago that I became a full-time uh, consultant slash contractor. And um, I'm also the co-author of a couple of books. Um, the first uh, called Leadership Matters, which is now in its second edition. And, um, and then the second book uh, is called Women in the Museum, Lessons from the Workplace. And that is looking at um, issues of gender equity in the museum workplace. Um, and so from those two topics, my co-author and I have been um, really active uh, speaking to groups. Um, uh, uh, we are co-founders of the Gender Equity in Museums movement, GEM, uh, which is now I think in its third or fourth year. And we have a growing uh, Facebook following, so um, so that's very exciting too. So um, in, enjoy kind of the um, advocacy end of, of the work, um, looking at some of the issues, kind of the the complex issues that face um, museums, uh, large and small, and having to do around leadership, of course equity and um and so it's been really kind of a a really interesting ride and have enjoyed it well, and I'm, continue to enjoy it <laughs> that's that's good i i uh i i feel compelled given my background and since you said that now you've been focusing for the past few years on consulting to say welcome to the dark side so <laughs> the um but leaving leaving that aside uh for those people who haven't immediately tuned out after that comment the um <laughs> we we um i i would love to um 
have you uh, put on especially your leadership thinking hat and uh, to talk a little bit because now we are certainly um, at a transition time. You know, whenever uh, any sort of big event happens in a museum, it could be a, um, a natural event, you know, a tornado, an earthquake, a pandemic, mm -hmm. heaven mm -hmm. forfend. It could be um, mm -hmm. a financial or a, a, a sort of internal management event that causes some big tumult and transition um, for the museum. Um, there is always the point where <laughs> people sort of look around at each other and say, okay, we want to move forward and we don't just want to go back to how things were. We know we need to um, be thinking about things differently as we move forward and how can we do that? Right, right. And so I, I would love if you might touch on a couple of topics in terms of that organizational shift and that management shift that you think are really key to people's thinking as they sort of chart uh, a sustainable and equitable path uh, forward. Sure. Um, I think where I'd like to start is by saying that m most of the crises that I think museums face tend to be rather narrow in scope um, in that um, it's a particular thing that has happened within the institution, generally speaking. It affects everyone in the institution. But um, what we're seeing now is a, with the pandemic, a crisis um, that's not restricted to the internal workings of one institution. Um, this, is a, a, this is a crisis that affects, of course, is global in scope and affects not only um, the economy, but healthcare, society, um, everything, essentially. So in, in a way, it's a time to really stop and say, everything is in flux, and for all we know is going to stay in flux for some time to come as, 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 as things unfold. Um, and frankly, things are unfolding every day around this pandemic. Um, so um, it's, it's useful to think about how the institution can, uh, I hesitate to use the word unfold with the pandemic, but that may be um, an apt way to look at it. But, but to certainly say, what if, to ask the question, what if? What we have a, in a manner of speaking, we have kind of a, a space here um, that does allow us, those of us who wanna think of it this way, as an opportunity, allows us an opportunity to ask the question, what if? What if we did this differently? What if we didn't have this? What if, you know, what if, what if, what if? And, um, and I think that's the, the big challenge for museum leaders uh, right now. Um, and when I say leader, I mean board leaders, institution heads, department heads, informal leaders in the institution, everybody has a role to play in this, to really kind of stop and think, how do we reframe this crisis as an opportunity for this institution? And it gives um, a certain amount of um, leeway to make change and to do it rapidly. Um, think how, how sometimes the red tape of an institution, particularly the large ones, but it's not exclusive, exclusively large institutions. Uh, not just um, large ones. <laughs> no, not just large ones. The red tape can tie decision making up for weeks, months, years at a time. Um, a, a, a crisis often can uh, provide the lubrication to really uh, ad advance decision making in ways that um, 
just don't happen on a, on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And so um, it reminds me of Rahm Emanuel's quote, at least he's given the uh, credit for the quote of never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think that leaders of um, museums, cultural institutions, all nonprofits, and we certainly know this is happening in the for-profit sector, they're using this crisis to ask those what if questions and to make change that will ultimately uh, create new, new programmatic directions, but also um, realign the institution, restructure the institution. So make significant internal changes, make new changes in terms of relationships with external audiences. And I think that if a leader is confident enough uh, in the ability of the staff and volunteers to, to ask what if and explore, that um, the museum that opens uh, tomorrow, next month, next year, is not gonna be the museum that closed at the beginning of March. And that, con that concept uh, came from the director of the Philbrook Museum, Scott Stewart, who said, you know, our museum is, that reopens is not the museum that closed. And, and so I think that this is kind of an exciting time even though it's fraught with a lot of very, very difficult decisions. It's, uh, it's like opening a new museum. It's exciting and daunting at the same time, which is, which right. is uh, sort of a heady combination. So um, you, a couple of the things you touched on there, I, it's not often that, um, well, I'll speak for myself, it's not often that I think of museums as being inherently nimble or quick right. <laughs> in, in doing things. Right. So um, I'm just wondering um, what suggestions you might have for leaders, and I take your point, leaders at every level, how people can feel like they are helping to contribute to building a flexible, nimble, Mm -hmm. let's let's talk about flexibility mm -hmm. and, and nimbleness uh, and maybe even more than quickness or rapidity what 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 kinds of things are in in your work in your consulting work what kinds of qualities do you find uh, or do you sort of look for or encourage for organizations to become more nimble and flexible especially yeah. as a result of uh, a, a, a turmoil or some tumult Right. Um, I would say that you're right on the money that m most organizations uh, are, are not particularly nimble. Um, however, it's, a, it's a, a skill that needs to be practiced. And if you don't practice it, you, you never get more nimble. So, um, and so are, there are things that I think that institutions can do to I increase their nimble quotient, if you will. And um, among them is the way they approach planning. And I think that many of us are used to, you know, a fairly um, straightforward, tried and true kind of planning process that where the emphasis is on process. And um, we, we know from studies and, and, and from organizations who um, practice, um, what's more generically called scenario planning, where you're constantly asking what if, and you're creating, you're creating scenarios. Some could happen, some will never happen, but you're at least thinking uh, uh, about possibilities. And the more you do that, the more resilient and agile you are for whatever the outcome might be, because you've already thought about it. And to keep that process going, um, it's not a one and done thing, it's really an ongoing thing. And um, to keep that going, I think, is, is a skill that needs to be uh, learned and practiced. And, um, and I think we're gonna see more of that, the notion of scenario planning or whatever you might uh, call it. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a, a good, good for organizations, it's good for budgeting, 
And frankly, it's good for your career too. <laughs> yeah. So you can use it in a lot of different, uh, a uh, lot of different ways. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, being <laughs> being an exhibits guy, I'm always thinking, what what's our plan B here? What, like, You've what if this doesn't? What B. exactly if this doesn't work out? What what's our what's our what's our option? What's our plan B? What's our plan C? And and you know, it's still cues to the to the content or to the story to what you're trying mm -hmm. to get across, but. You, you, the whole house of cards doesn't fall apart if one little thing doesn't go the way you expect it to. Several, on a very practical level, I'll tell you, several years ago, I got to hear Michael Kaiser speak, and Michael Kaiser was the head of the Kennedy Center a number of years ago, and was known as kind of the turnaround arts king and that sort of thing. And he was talking about how when he goes into a donor meeting, a big donor meeting, he always has a list of potential projects in his pocket. He's going to make one specific ask, but if that donor doesn't like that ask, he whips out his, <laughs> he's, got, he's got 10 more uh, at the ready. Uh, and, and, and it assures him, himself and his organization that he's gonna leave that meeting with some sort of a commitment to something that's from a the list. Great, that's a great tip. That's a so great talk trick. about plan B. He had plan B, C, D, E, and F already laid out. Yeah, and, and, if, and I think we have to apply that same kind of thinking and, and, and skill and practice to all the work that we do. Well, and if a conversation or events go a certain way, if you already know you have literally in your pocket something that aligns with that turn of events or conversation, you say, hey, okay, let's go this way for a while instead. And, and it's still something that's of use and of benefit to the organization. And still ties in with the mission. I mean, the mission is the, is the, the bedrock of an organization and everything needs to spring from that mission. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, some wild left field idea that, that maybe a donor would love, but it has nothing to do. We're not talking about that. Uh, we're really talking about intentional making of plans and uh, developing strategies that will meet the mission, but will suit the needs of what whoever it is—a donor, an audience, a, you know, whoever it might be. We need we need left field ideas that still relate to the mission. Well, That's what we're well, doing. yeah, well, yeah, um, very true, very true. So um, I know you you mentioned you you've written and obviously spoken and uh, done a lot of thinking about leadership. You know, one thing that strikes me, which I'd love to hear you um, talk about a little bit, is, you know, if you are a leader at any level of the organization and the uh, uh, events are such that the organization is moving and needs to move forward in a new direction, um, what do you do if you are a leader sort of faced with resistance? Because uh, it's one thing to say, well, we don't want to, we don't want to waste a catastrophe here, and this is a real opportunity. And then there are people who are like, oh, I, don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't think that's the thing. How, right. What right. what advice might you have for uh, a leader who is wanting to bring their team and in service of their community and their mm -hmm. mission uh, forward, but uh, faces some. I'll say internal or external resistance. Right. Um, well, um, the advice I sh I'll share is I learned fairly recently um, from um, a, a Harvard uh, webinar that I attended on leading in crisis. And um, the speaker talked about the fact that uh, one of the ways you might uh, uh, or one of the tactics you might use in dealing with resistant people is to emphasize the downstream impact of doing something or, or not doing something in this case. And that um, the, the idea being that any, uh, any crisis has cascading effect throughout an institution and everyone will be affected one way or the other. And so if, if a, a leader can make a case for how it's gonna affect someone in some department 
um, that's you know downstream from the executive office um, that 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 may be a way to to kind of convince people or help them see that if they don't move forward or can't move forward that they're going to be um, really stuck in a, in a not great place. And I think that that works for leading up to uh, when you have uh, reticent board members. And frankly, um, we're human and humans are generally <laughs> reticent to change. We just, you know, we're not really we, wired for we it don't, very well. We don't, we don't want to be made <laughs> uncomfortable or uncertain. That's, right. That's exactly right. So, um, so coming up with uh, sort of the uh, argument, for lack of a better word, to help people kind of think more broadly and get kind of get out of their headspace and and start to see the implications in a bro more broad way, I think is um, is a tactic. Uh, another tactic that um, a number of our leaders in Leadership Matters talked about was um, asking staff to make change with the caveat that if the change didn't work, we would go back to the way it was before. So they couched it as an experiment. Let's and try. Let's, let's, let's try. give this a try. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, don't worry, we'll go back to what we know. And it just was enough to raise the comfort level of many staff who were reticent uh, to make a change. And um, they knew that you know, the, the raft wasn't too far behind them and they could grab it if they needed it. And that was, that was very helpful to help some staff kind of get over that, that period of ambiguity of, of just simply not knowing what was gonna happen. So that's another tactic I, I, I would encourage people to think about using. Well, that's, that's good. I think uh, also both of those rely on uh, sort of the less abstract and helping people understand, well, what does this mean for me in particular and my job, which of course is important to people. And I think you can do a fair amount of um, scenario planning in staff teams um, throughout an institution and um, and that just gets people thinking about the what ifs without necessarily saying we're going to make a decision and we're going to jump in this direction let's just sit and talk about what if we did this or what if we did that and what would the implications be and um, what would be hard for you to adopt or adapt and and kind of approach it that way and instead of some sort of a top-down um fiat that says we're going to do this now and um and really kind of you know make it help it to bubble up rather than just cascade down so um i think those are some great tips i i it's always important to me when we're doing these videos or when i'm doing a presentation at a conference or that it's like oh what can people take away for their own situation and i think what's great about what uh, some of the tips and techniques you've shared is that uh, I think they really work at um, any organizational level and, and it's sort of irrespective of the size of the organization. I will um, say though, Paul, that if the staff leader, the director, um, is not willing uh, or able to um, embrace change then then i think any of these tactics might not work or, or could or would work maybe on a micro level in a department but not not necessarily in an institution wide uh, situation and and i think we do have we you know we have a fair number of leaders in our in in the field who um again they share the same human trait of <laughs> not liking change and and for whatever reason are not comfortable they're just not comfortable with major change and um and so encouraging them to you know make make incremental change um with the hope of you know making larger change along the way although i frankly what all that i read right now about 
of the pandemic is that this is a time not to sit around and fritter at, by making incremental change, but to make big change. This is an opportunity to make big change if you've so, got the guts to do it. Well, so um, I'm sure you have the guts. So let's let's end on a <laughs> let's end on a let's end on a gutsy big big level. So and you're 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 you've got this great advice. So if if uh, if uh, we we swung the magic wand here and you were um, now in charge of a museum or organization, uh, what would be the first thing that you would do if you were if you were trying to ramp up an organization after it had been shut down or it, after it had uh, been faced with a calamity? What what? what is the first thing that you as a leader would really think about doing? I would think about communicating uh, to uh, staff, volunteers, the board, of course, the, and our stakeholders, uh, where the institution is now and what we're thinking about now. And, and try and make it very clear that we don't necessarily know all the answers now. We may never know all the answers, but that um, we realize that there are some opportunities that are worth exploring and we're gonna try and do that. And, um, you know, if they're experiments, if they're treated as experiments, that's fine. Um, so I, I think that communication is so critical. Um, and I will say that when I first started out, when I was a young director, um, I probably didn't communicate as much as, well, I know I did. And this is something I've, I've, I've learned over a long, long period of time. And, uh, and I, think, I think though that a lot of uh, directors who are far younger than me um, would like to think that they, they know that lesson already. And they didn't have to <laughs> take 40 years to learn it. Huh? But, oh, oh, but, but I mean, some of these lessons, yeah, can they come with experience? But um, I think that the communication bit is really important to be as transparent as possible um, and to let people know what the institution is thinking, what its ch challenges are, what its hopes are as well. So the communication piece, I think, is absolutely critical to building trust, as well as to uh, explaining information or delivering information. It's about building trust. Yeah. So that would be my advice out of the starting blocks. No, I think that's good advice. I think that communication aspect um when you when you sort of rewind and look back at projects that were successful or less so uh certainly the communication aspect of things comes comes to the fore when you're when you're evaluating the success or or lack thereof of projects right well right. that's 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 a that's a nice way Nice way to end our conversation today, our communication, right, which I right. appreciate. I, uh, again, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and um, I'll look, uh, we'll look to maybe have some links uh, uh, to resources or that, your, mm -hmm. your, your books or other things that we touched on that you think would be good. And uh, with that, Zoom, I will zoom off into the future here <laughs> yes. uh, after our conversation. And I hope, uh, I hope everyone watching will uh, take these uh, ideas and tips that you shared to help them move into the future as well. Thank you, Paul. I, it's been fun being here and I wish everyone an awful lot of good luck uh, going forward. Thanks a lot, Anne. I appreciate it. You're welcome.